So hello everyone and uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, today we have uh, Karen Fabayan who uh, was born in Iran to British Armenian parents and moved to Leeds in November 1978, just prior to the Islamic Revolution of the January um, 1979. Fabayan, we are very privileged to have her as a multidisciplinary artist who, whose work engages with audiences through the visual and performing arts and creative writing. Uh, Swallows and Armenians is Babayan's book of short stories and essays, which explores the relationship between Arthur Ransom and the Altunyan family, and firmly reestablishes the connection using newly appraised correspondence and diaries. In 2016, Babayan gained a PhD in contemporary art practice from uh, Leeds Beckett University and was awarded the Sea Art Cumbria Artist of the Year. Welcome, Ms. Babayan, and thank you for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vanuhi. That's uh, very beautifully done. I'd like to say thank you very much for this opportunity to share my book with a, uh, a new audience um, and, and some old audience too. There's a few people here who have been to other talks that I've done, and I hope that I will be able to um, give you a little bit more in-depth information, um, something new, something new for you tonight. Um, uh, it's fantastic to be given this opportunity to talk by the Diocese of the Armenian Church, United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. Um, and uh, I'd also like to pass on a few more thanks before I start. Um, I need to thank the Gazellian, the Altunyan and the Smith families uh, for their ongoing support of the project uh, through learning work for exhibitions, for access to and the permission to use photographs from the family archives. Also, um, thank you to the Arthur Ransom uh, Archive in Special Collections at the University of Leeds for uh, gaining access to letters, the diary extracts and photographs um, I'm grateful for the permissions that were granted to me from the Arthur Ransom Literary Trustees for the use of images and extracts for my project um, and also enthusiastic support uh, for which I'm very grateful uh, from the Arthur Ransom Society and we have Peter Wright who's the chair of TARS here tonight which is absolutely brilliant and I forgot to say that uh, Teresa Smith is here who is also loaning work to the exhibition and she's Robin Collingwood's daughter so that's a real honour thank you Teresa for coming and, and welcome everybody else really pleased to meet you um, also, I mean, mean to thank Arts Council for their lottery funding because without that funding um, to support the project that I've been working on for the past few years, uh, I've been able to achieve far more uh, than I thought was ever possible. So now that we've done the thanks, I'm going to do a screen share and we will go straight into... Um, yeah, we've done that. I'm going to share the sound. Right. Um, this talk will have excerpts from my book, Swallows and Armenians, that I will be reading. As it is a, a book club talk, I believe. This is a book club talk. And I think the Diocese of the Armenian Church runs a monthly book group. So that's absolutely brilliant. There's also going to be a chance to listen to a clip from the audio book. Uh, and there'll be lots of images for you to see. So Swallows and Amazons was published in 1930. Where I live now, Lake District Tourism presents a very white English cultural menu of the Wordsworths, Beatrix Potter, John Ruskin, and of course, Arthur Ransom. Ransom's books have come to stand for something quintessentially English. Um, when in reality, and ironically, this gaggle of upper middle class English children having jolly japes, sailing and camping uh, was inspired by Anglo-Armenian children from Aleppo in Syria. Uh, my aim is to put these children back where they belong, back in the story, back in the heart of the Lake District, 
just like Shaka Major Chilingiri in here, dancing on the shores of Derwent Water. And this joyous photograph was taken by Azador Gazelian, Titi Gazelian's son, and appeared in the Times newspaper and the launch of the project on the 11th of March, 2019. Swallows and Armenians is a fascinating story, I think, about the Altunians. I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't completely entranced by it and fell in love with the whole idea. They are a family who have the same ethnicity as myself and uh, who also, like me, lived comfortably in two or more worlds. As I am a visual artist, the project began as an exhibition, uh, but it soon became something much more than that. It encompassed creative writing in the form of a book, short stories. And this is the cover and back cover. Um, it was published by the Wild Pansy Press, University of Leeds. Um, it is now an audio book available through Audible. I have made several art films and performative works. In 2019, Swallows and Armenians was launched with the support of Arts Council Lottery funding and the Arthur Ransom Society TARS also supported the publication. And we launched it with um, a talk at Words by the Water, Festival of Words at Theatre by the Lake in Keswick, alongside a, a substantial exhibition uh, on two floors of my own contemporary artworks. And these were inspired and also derived from the material that I found in the Leeds University Library Special Collections. You can see that in the first image here, Brotherton Collection, University of Leeds is signed on, stamped on the back of this photograph, which has been um, noted by uh, Dora as being of Taki, Susie and Titi at Suakuluk, August 1931, uh, as well as the, the photographs um, and images that the families themselves loaned me. Um, we also created a devised performance by Young Company, the youth outreach arm of Theatre by the Lake. Um, and these children were were children from Keswick and the surrounding villages, surrounding towns and villages. And this performance was directed um, and devised by my daughter, Persia Babayan Taylor. This incredible collection of historic portraits and landscapes uh, were loaned by the family. Um, uh, the three artists whose work they were, W.G. Collingwood, who is the children's grandfather in Coniston, Dora Altunyan, their mother, and Mavis Gazellian, who is also known as Titi, of course, and they were generously loaned by the Gazellian family who hold this particular collection. Uh, my partners were several in this project. My daughter, who's an actor musician, Persia Babayan Taylor, co directed the performance. Dance artist Shakir Major Chilingirian um, brought her Circle of Dan Life dance project. Uh, in recognition of the contribution that the Altunyan Hospital made to the lives of genocide survivors in Aleppo. And Shaka, by the way, is someone whose Anglo-Armenian history is almost identical to mine, and I've known her since our childhoods together in Iran. Also in the photograph on the right-hand side is Zina Ashbury, Ni Khan, um, who inspired one of the stories in my book called Perfect Look. And it's based on her experience as an extra in the 1974 film version of Swallows and Amazons. Um, I received further funding to, uh, for, for Swallows and Armenians to fly the nest, so to speak. And I took it, took the exhibition further afield to Carlisle and Northumberland here at the old fire station in Carlisle and the Maritime Centre in New Begin by the Sea. And as well as this, I also developed a more grown up script for theatre and I was mentor mentored by a playwright called Mick Yates. And this um, play script is currently in research and development mode with students from Guildford School of Acting, one of the foremost acting schools in the UK. And um, it, the um, book has been literally brought to life through an audio book narrated by my daughter, Persia Babi and Taylor. And together as a team, we are reasserting the importance of this Anglo-Armenian family from Aleppo in an adventure story written for children that has become part of English Lake District mythology. Why is this so important? I think to ignore the cultural background of the children is to miss the relevance of the story to our own lived experience of the world. 
I think it misses the opportunity of introducing British and international audiences and children of an ethnically diverse mix to the rich literary heritage of the Lake District and connects us all to a significant and important international world event such as the Armenian Genocide. Um, this photograph was uh, sent to me by Barbara Altunyan, who is Roger Altunyan's daughter. Roger is the baby in the middle there. She sent it to me for my talk for the Armenian Institute, and it was the first time that it was shown in the public domain. So um, it's an absolute joy, this photograph. It's taken in Aleppo, and it's Dora and Ernest, and four of their five children. And it's taken in around 1922, 1923. We know that because Roger was born in 1922. Um, and here we have in the middle, Taki or Takuhi, uh, which means queen in Armenian. Taki Harriet Altunyan, she was born in Hampstead in London in 1917. She was named after, on the one side, uh, Takuhi after her great-grandmother from Sivas in Ottoman Turkey and on the other side Harriet after her grandmother Harriet Redal from Armagh, Northern Ireland. Susie on the left, Susie Arshalouis Altunyan, all the girls had both English and Armenian names. Also born in Hampstead two years later in 1919, her name means morning like Arshalouis. Mavis, Mavis Araxi on the right here, but sitting by her dad, Ernest, known as Titty. She chose that name for herself after um, a children's story called Titty Mouse and Tatty Mouse. She was born in Aleppo in 1920. Araxi is after the Arax or Aras River that runs through Turkey, now Azerbaijan and Armenia. And in the middle, the baby Roger Edward Collingwood Altunyan, born in Aleppo in 1922. He's the only one without an Armenian name, but Roger is after a character from one of his father's favorite adventure books. The fifth baby or fifth child, Bridget Mary Lucine or Lucine Altunyan, um, not in the picture, was born in 1926 in Aleppo. Lucine is our moon, a moon for our, in Armenian. And these children had an extraordinary mix of ethnicities. They were Armenian, Northern Irish, Swiss and English heritage. The children lived in Aleppo in the main where their paternal grandparents, Aram Asador Altunyan, an ambitious doctor from Sivas and Harriet Riddle, a Northern Irish matron from the college hospital in Ain Tab, established the first modern hospital in Syria. Um, I will be reading you some extracts from two of Taki Altunyan's books. This one, Chimes from a Wooden Bell, which was published in 1990 by I.B. Taurus in London, New York. Um, and uh, the other in Aleppo Once, which was uh, written earlier than this book. They give us um, the evidence and the information about the uh, community that surrounded the Altunyans, the family and the hospital which they established. Um, so I will be reading you now this excerpt about uh, Aram Asador Altunyan, this portrait of him, I think by Mavis Altunyan Titi uh, from a photograph. I don't think this is by Dora uh, because it's very much Mavis's signature style, I think. Um, so Taki writes, my grandfather left his birthplace in central Anatolia as soon as he could. After his father's death in about 1860, when he was seven, his best hope of escape was to train as a doctor, which he did with the help of American missionaries first in their mission hospitals in Turkey and subsequently in America and Europe. Back in Turkey and fully qualified, he married the, the Irish matron of a mission hospital and the couple set out on their own, touring the towns and villages of the South as a mobile medical team. 
This undoubtedly saved my grandfather's life because by the time the most serious massacres of Armenians began, he was well established in Aleppo, which although still at that time part of the Ottoman Empire was an Arab town. Also by then, he had acquired an impressive reputation as a doctor and the Turks considered him too valuable to destroy. My grandfather was 60 by the time he got permission from the Turks to build a hospital. He devoted the next 30 years of his long life to making it into a sort of super space hospital or Mayo Clinic, hung between East and West and as good as any in the world. Aleppo, by the way, is about 400 miles due south of Sivas. Aram Asador's early reputation was built by a series of either lucky, very lucky, or well-managed miracles. He correctly diagnosed the daughter of Sultan Abdul Hamid's bodyguard as having typhoid when she was being treated by dozens of other doctors for tuberculosis. She recovered and the Sultan was impressed. And in the year of especially bad cholera epidemic, the American, which is what he was called in the town uh, because of his training in America and also at the American Missionary College, uh, with his tubes and culture plates inspired confidence and it appeared to resurrect many who appeared dead. He persuaded people to use simple hygiene to avoid shaking hands or embracing each other um, so as to stop the spread of infection. The Sultan issued an order that no one but the Armenian was to countersign any health report coming from Aleppo. And that's quite an extraordinary thing, given the way Sultan Abdul Hamid treated the Armenians, basically. Finally, after curing another Pasha of cancer of the mouth, permission to build his own hospital was granted. This is a portrait of Nora Chauvet, who is sister to Ernest. So, um, I'm going to continue with some descriptions of how it was that really Aram Asador was able to kind of uh, work his way through the very dangerous times that he was living in. Taki continues to write, it was 1896, the year after the x-ray had been invented. My grandfather bought one. Aleppo was the only city in the Ottoman Empire that had an x-ray machine. Needless to say, the courtiers at Constantinople were jealous. Send the x-ray to us at once, they demanded. So a collection of old wires, coils and burnt out tubes were neatly packed and dispatched. Nothing more was heard. No questions asked, no instructions sent. Some months later, Jamal Pasha, later to be commander in chief of the Turkish army, broke his leg near Aleppo and had to be x-rayed. She says, he was persuaded by my father's sister, Nora, to divert army rations to feed uh, little Armenian children who were wandering about everywhere in a most pitiful state, having lost their families in the massacres. Um, I, I find that an absolutely extraordinary statement. Um, she is again mentioned later, this is Nora Chauvet, mentioned later in the book as being away on business involving Armenian refugees. She, so Nora was very much involved with the relief effort for the Armenian refugees following the Armenian deportations and the genocide. Um, Taki goes on, although Azador's brother had been recently cut down in the streets of Bitlis in front of his family, he was able to put that aside and devote himself to his job. I do not know if my grandfather ever saw his mother again after he left Sivas to go to Ain Tab. My father once summoned up the courage to ask his father how on earth he had managed to carry on working for and treating the friends of the people who had murdered his brother and possibly the rest of his family. The old man admitted that there had been a moment when he had thought of cutting down a Turk in revenge for his brother and then committing suicide. 
but a violent and obstinate anger had welled up after the first shock of grief, a determination to live the rest of his life as fully as possible and show them. His wife died to Harriet, died of cancer in 1907, and this brilliant doctor was unable to save her. Tacky mentions in her book that before her death, her uh, the grandmother, her grandmother Harriet, had started an orphanage for destitute Armenian children. And that's the only mention I have in the books of that. The children's mother, Dora, herself became involved with relief work, writing to her sister Ursula in England to help fundraise to send money. This letter can be seen in the W.G. Collingwood archives in the special collections at Cardiff University. During the first Christmas, Taki remembers in 1919 in Aleppo, she writes that Aleppo was clogged with the victims of deportations, huddled miserably in the winter's cold. She says that outside of their house was darkness and desolation. Before we go on to uh, this lovely dapper photograph of uh, Ernest Altunyan, whose name I couldn't remember, um, I'd like to just reference an article in The Lancet, which Taki mentions about the Altunyan Hospital and the extraordinary work they were doing. And this article was published in The Lancet in 1927. And it says that the Altunyan Hospital in Aleppo had to date performed no fewer than 28,000 operations, some of them plastic surgery and the reconstruction of limbs, which is absolutely amazing. So the children's father, Ernest here, himself was a brilliant doctor and helped to run the hospital. He was born in London, far from the Armenian homeland and was brought up by his Irish mother as an English gentleman. And I think he was born in London because unfortunately when um, Harriet and Aram Azador were um, doing their mobile hospital thing, you know, all around the countryside in uh, Ottoman Turkey in the South, they had, she had given birth to and lost a child, a daughter. And so I think by coming back to London and also Aram um, Azador came to London to study pediatric medicine, um, concerted effort and determination that that would not happen to him again. So Ernest was born in London um, and he was brought up as an English gentleman. He went to boarding school in rugby. The children's mother, the Swallows children, their mother was an artist from the Collingwood family of Lake District artists, writers and philosophers with links to Victorian art critic and social thinker John Ruskin. The children spoke Armenian, Turkish, English, French and Arabic and the food they ate, food they ate was a similar cultural mix. They visited their maternal grandparents every few years in Coniston, where they felt equally at home as in Aleppo. This is a portrait of Arthur Ransom as a quite a young man, I would say, here in the Lake District. In 1928, the family came to England to visit their grandparents once more. Ransom had also recently returned from his Russian adventures with Evgenia, his second wife, and settled in the Coniston area of the Lake District. Ransom already knew the Collingwoods very well indeed, visiting and staying with them regularly. And he saw himself as an honorary member of the family. He had met W.G. Collingwood originally as a teenager whilst he was walking in the fells above Coniston. W.G. was impressed by him, by his aspirations as a young writer. And Ransom already knew W.G.'s work because one of his favorite books as a child was Thorns, Thorstein of the Mere, which is a saga of the Northmen in Lakeland. And it was written by Collingwood, um, and it was about a young Viking boy settled at Greenard, a few miles from Coniston. Arthur was very much in need of a father figure because he'd lost his own father when he was 12. And uh, he was they, they were so familiar with this young man that he was invited to call WG wife's Dory aunt. And in turn, uh, the, the next generation of the Altunyan children affectionately called Arthur Uncle Arthur and his wife Aunt Jenya. And this was the Collingwood family home, Lane Head, 
which is on the shores of Coniston Water. Although they lived in a grand house, and here it looks at its at its very height, very grand house, but it was not theirs. They rented it initially, but then um, when it was sold, it was kind of bought by an heiress of a Liverpool shipping com company who, by way of patronage, she was a patron of the arts, and she allowed them to live there rent free. Um, although the family had a cook uh, and seemed to leave, live grandly, WG and his wife, Dory, they lived a hand-to-mouth a hand existence. For many years, um, WG worked for John Ruskin. As uh, I mentioned, John Ruskin before, he was a writer, philosopher, art critic and philanthropist. And later he took on the uh, job of Professor of Fine Art at Reading. This beautiful little painting, uh, which is going to be very kindly lent by Teresa Smith, Teresa and George Smith, um, whose daughter of Robin Collingwood, will be in the next uh, exhibition of Swallows and Armenians, which will be uh, at the Queen's Hall Art Centre in Hexham in September. And this is by W.G. Collingwood. And it's so perfect for the theme of the exhibition. Um, Dory, W.G.'s wife, painted miniature portraits in the main for wealthy Lake District families. And both of them were involved with homeschooling their children in the arts, languages, archaeology and philosophy. Arthur Ransom fell in love with this attractively bohemian family and so, by the way, did Ernest Altunyan. Um, Ernest was a friend of Robin Collingwood because they were both at rugby boarding school together. Um, Arthur Ransom also knew him, um, although he was younger than Arthur Ransom. He knew him from the school days there because he was also at school at rugby. This is the Collingwood family with the children quite young. Um, Arthur Ransom went sailing and fishing with the Collingwood children who were of a similar age to him. Dora the eldest on the left, followed by Barbara next, Robin and Ursula in age order there. Um, as an adult, Rob Ransom proposed to both Dora and Barbara and he was rejected by both of them. They saw him, I think, very platonically as, as friend, not husband material. Um, but they both stayed close friends with him and he with them. Um, Dora Collingwood did marry Ernest Altunyan. Um, she had met him 10 years uh, prior as a gauche 15 year old when her brother brought him home one weekend from rugby. Um, Dora and Ernest moved to London, had two children there and then went back to Aleppo for Ernest to help his father in the family hospital. And as you know, three of the uh, children were born there. Uh, this is the first book by Taki Altunyan in Aleppo once published in 1969 by John Murray. Um, I'd like to now kind of talk a little bit about the, uh, in, in a bit more detail about the staff uh, in the hospital um, and the staff who looked after the family, the Altunyan family. Um, so she says, I'm going to quote, Mr. Arevian owned the pharmacy. His assistant, Levon, was tall, thin and sad with a long, narrow face, which he exaggerated by wearing an extra high red fez. He had a bad stutter and we children practiced talking like Levon until our tongues were in knots. I mean, children are terrible, aren't they? Um, when we were helping trying, when we were helping to roll pills, Levon would get more and more frustrated trying to tell us what to do. You can just imagine it, can't you? Um, and often stutter himself to a halt. Astrik, which means little star, Levon's assistant, the sister of Eliza in the laboratory, was disabled. One of her legs was much shorter than the other, so she walked with a distressing lurch but she got about tremendously fast. Her happy face twinkled like a star. She was so short that she could hardly see over the counter or reach up to the medicine bottles, but tall Levon helped her to get things down. And in return, she always interpreted what he was trying to say when his tongue stuck like a stalling car. Astrik and Eliza lived with their widowed mother. Their father had been killed in the Turkish massacres. They came from Kharpet, the cent central mountainous part of Armenia, where people spoke the best Armenian unspoilt with Turkish and mispronunciations. 
We sometimes went to tea with them. They grew roses and carnations and all sorts of flowers and plants and arranged their one small room with much care. Their mother was pale and sad, but with the same illuminated smile as her daughter's. In her black widow's dress, she moved gracefully about, handing us tea, and we listened to the classical beauty of the Armenian language at its best. And then further on in Aleppo once, Taki describes other uh, Armenian survivors who are within and around the family, working for the family. She describes the dressmaker who would come to the house, dressed in widow's black, which showed up every piece of fluff and cotton, and her bosom was stuck with pins like a hedgehog. The children hated being fitted because it meant standing still for so long. And the shoemaker who came once or twice a year to measure them, and the tailor who made their father and grandfather's suits. She says, we did not realize that people had been employed sometimes to give them a job and prevent them starving. Ernest here, you can see him in the middle of the nurses there, uh, going uh, slightly gray at the temples. Ernest Altunyan ran a nursing school at the hospital and his dream was of a swarm of highly trained young ladies issuing yearly with a whir of starched linen. He was very strict with his trainee nurses and according to Taki often made them cry, which I think um, matrons of any hospital often, I think as my mother would remember, often made their trainee nurses cry. So I don't think he was out of the ordinary for that. But apparently he was also very fond of them and proud when they graduated. All the girls were orphans from the Turkish massacres. And as he put it, the hereditary enemy of 75% of our patients. The Altunyan Nursing School managed to turn out three or four passably trained girls every year Dora, his wife, designed the silver badge they all wore, a green enameled shamrock in memory of Harriet Riddell. So we're going to go now to my book, Swallows and Armenians, where I've taken some of these characters and I've put them into my stories. And my stories in the middle there, there's five stories and they're set initially in Coniston, Appeal Island Day, in Aleppo, back to Coniston with Bluebird, um, into Windermere with the perfect look, and Bradford and Coniston for the adventurer, final one. And they span from 1928 to 2018. And I shall read the first one, which is set in Aleppo. And um, it's Ernest arriving for his breakfast. The stone steps resounded with a slap of riding boots, leather against stone. Ernest, impressive in his riding breeches and dripping with sweat under his Norfolk tweed jacket, felt energized by his morning gallop. He wiped his brow with a pristine white hanky, then roused the household to his presence with a trumpeting blow of his nose itchy with alpine dust. He put his head round the kitchen door where Armine, the cook, stood, made nervous by the blustering presence of Dr. Effendi in her domain. She waited his instructions for breakfast. Louise Paris, digging Armine, good morning, he said as he bowed. Ten minutes? And he gestured ten with his fingers. The cook swiftly turned and reached for the eggs, cracked them into a bowl and gave them a quick whisk, then broke a large piece of white sheep's cheese into the mix, a generous pinch of salt and pepper and straight into the frying pan for the doctor's favorite breakfast omelet. Armine's now ample bosom and belly belied the deep hunger she had endured during the deportations only 15 years ago but cruelty metered out to her on the roadside was visible in her cast-clouded eyes and lopsided smile. She had been picked up by American missionaries who had taken her to a field hospital. Later, she was taken to the Altunyan Hospital in Aleppo. 
after months of recuperation and nowhere else to go, she'd shown herself more than capable of earning her keep in the hospital kitchen. Indeed, she'd shown cooking flair, so the senior doctor offendi, Baron Asador, had given Armine the job as house cook. She fed his family and did her best every day by way of thanks for her deliverance. There were many survivors like her in this house and in this hospital. Their eyes gave them away. That and the limps, ticks, stutters and stammers. Um, the next um, reading I'd like to do is again from the story in Aleppo once and it's about Garnick who is a manservant who's um, collecting the breakfast things and the children are sitting at breakfast. Dora stood up and Garnick came to clear the table. Shushan from the labs had told Dora that during the deportations, the Turks had broken his neck and half thrown him into the, and thrown him into the Euphrates. They'd fished him out half dead downstream. The children abruptly stopped chattering. It's him, whispered Susie, as the gnarled young man came in with a tray and began to pile on the dishes. His spine was strangely twisted so that as he stood straight, he seemed to be turning away, his head straining on his neck. He's like the olive tree, you know, the one in the courtyard of the house in Sivas Black Grandpa told us about, said Taki. The olive tree had been planted by the children's grandfather's great-grandfather. As it had grown over the years, it had turned towards the sun and away from the wind so that the trunk was twisted around like a great big lump of toffee. Shnora galotun, Garnik, said Dora thankfully. She'd been a willing pupil of languages since she arrived in Aleppo, learning Armenian, Turkish and Arabic. Her teacher, Aram, was a young man who had lost most, most of his family, his parents, brothers and all but one sister in the genocide. Dora's father-in-law, Azador, had taken him under his wing where he was, when he was 14 and educated him. He was now in Germany at law school. I can't bear to look, said Susie under her breath, and Titty and Roger closed their eyes as well. Don't be silly, you nitwit, said Taki. Let's pretend nothing is the matter. He can't help it. I can't help it, Roger sniffed. He gives me bad dreams, Taki. The young man, arms straining, tray overloaded, struggled to keep straight, overtipped, lurched back and off tumbled one of Dora's best china teacups, smashing spectacularly into tiny pieces on the marble of the terrace. Nerogutun, sorry digging Dora, he stammered imploringly. Oh dear, sighed Dora, touching his arm reassuringly. Vuchinch, venas chagar, never mind, nobody's died. It's just some old China, nothing more. So before I um, go on to the next um, reading, uh, I do also want to mention Grigor Effendi, who was photography um, of the, in, on the X-ray machine, Melkon, who minded the engine room. Uh, apparently the children learned a lot of Armenian history from him. And um, also remarkably, Ardor Effendi, who organized the defense of Ain Tab in 1920. He was an Armenian national hero and he was there managing the Altunyan's farms. Um, uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, so this photograph, which I've um, kind of given uh, the kind of contemporary art twist to, is this very small photograph, but it's monumentally ambitious and I believe it was taken by Dora. Um, in the summer of 1928 the family returned to Coniston and found Arthur and Evgenia now living there also. That summer of sailing, camping and fishing with the family was a catalyst for Ransom to embark on writing his first adventure uh, fiction book for children and uh, much of the artwork has grown out of the Altun Young Gazellian family photo archive. And this piece is entitled, Write Me Something to Smell the Wind and Rain Again. And that is taken from a letter that Ernest wrote to Arthur from Aleppo. 
Um, and Ernest loved the Lake District and called it Lanehead his home in the north. So I, as I mentioned, I think this photo is taken by Dora because her sister Barbara is at the helm, sailing the boat like a pro. Tacky and Susie on the right there. Titty is on her nanny, nanny Elmas's knee. And Elmas, um, which means a kind of rough diamond, came from a village, mountain village in Syria. And uh, I shall now read that particular excerpt. Elmas was Armenian like Miss Dora's husband and loved, loved those children like she was a blood relation. She was the religious sort, always reading the Bible and singing mournful songs with a doleful expression. She did so even when she was boating with the family on the lake or walking up the fells, so the children said. Ada had never dreamt of climbing the fells. Ada is the family cook, by the way, very Cumbrian. What's up yonder? She would say to her husband when she had went home at night. I can't see what up fusses about. There's nubbit fells and water, wherever thou looks. It's work thee wants. That's reet, her husband would exclaim, nodding in agreement. Elmas dressed as if she was in mourning. She kept her head covered with a black silk scarf and wore black dresses down to her ankles. Ada had heard about the Armenians through snatches of overhead con overheard conversations. There had been disaster in the homelands, Jart, Elmas called it. When Ada asked what that meant, Miss Taki translated it as if to, as it was to destroy or smash. Miss Dora had tried to explain. It was deportation, murder, starvation, disease, and other unspeakable things. It had mainly happened around the start of the Great War. She had heard the children talk about the other staff in Aleppo, the nannies, cooks, nurses and drivers who were mostly all orphans or survivors of this jart, and Ada didn't doubt that Elmas was one too. This photo, circa 1927 or 28, shows four of the eldest children, <coughs> Tunyan children, Taki, Susie, Titi and Roger, pictured in their scouts' outfits. And it would have been around the time they first met with Uncle Arthur, 1928. <coughs> at, at that time, around 1928, in the run-up to 1928, in Aleppo, the, these children had the run of the hospital. It was their playground, basically, it was their playground. Taki writes in her book, Chimes from a Wooden Bell, we were allowed to run free over most of the hospital, although not in the wards or operating theater, but there was always a welcome for us in the laboratories. The workers there, Eliza and Arzniv, never seemed too occupied uh, to let us squint down microscopes or play with the Dear little doll stoves used for the Wasserman testing. I think they're Bunsen burners, aren't they? <laughs> they probably. These, these are the children who inspired Arthur Ransom. These are the children who were imaginative, free-spirited, unconstrained by social norms of the time, whose nannies and playmates were the genocide survivors who were the hospital staff and who looked after the family in Aleppo and Coniston. Here the three girls appear on Mavis, one of the two boats belonging to the family in Coniston. The other was named Swallow. And this uh, exhibit, this piece of art, work a model boat is called here are the swallows and it has been the flagship literally of the exhibition and the book um, and it appears on the book and in all the exhibition posters and it's uh, true to the colors of the original swallow to the six for whom it was written in exchange for a pair of slippers Arthur Ransom put this dedication to the family in the first editions of Swallows and Amazons, but it was later removed and replaced by an introduction which stated that it was his own childhood that inspired it. And I'm very pleased to say actually that it's gone back in to the books 
um, I think since 2016, it has gone back in. And so both appear in the books, both Arthur Ransom's own introduction, as well as this dedication to the family. <clears throat> In this photo, Arthur and his wife Evgenia with four of the children in Aleppo, Titi, Taki, Roger and Bridget, the youngest one there. Um, and uh, it was taken when Arthur and Evgenia visited the family in 1932 at great cost and they took a boat with them and they stayed there for three months. Um, and, um, oh, by the way, the boat uh, was on request of Ernest, actually. Um, so Arthur wrote um, quite a lot of Peter Duck, his third book of the series there in Dora's studio at the top of the house. Um, but unfortunately, during that visit, cracks appeared in the relationship because of various disagreements between the Ransoms and the Altunians. In older age, Arthur Ransom um, further distanced himself from the Altunian children by writing in his autobiography that they had identified themselves, regardless of sex, with my characters. Um, the family, the Altunian family, uh, say that he told Taki that he'd had to turn her into John so that he'd have another boy in the story. Um, but what we do have is evidence here from in the form of letters that Taki wrote to Uncartha at the time, um, which she signed her letters to Uncartha as Captain John of SD Swallow, something which he didn't discourage. Um, if only he had remembered that um, uh, before the fallout in 1931, he'd written this for the uh, American magazine, The Horn Book, volume seven, on page 38 to 43, entitled Swallows and Amazons, How It Came to Be Written. Um, he writes, about once in every five years, a friend of mine who has an enormous family and lives in Syria, brings his family home and spends the summer with them on the shores of a lake which he and his wife and I have known ever since we were ourselves children. We have remembered, we have played around in boats, sorry, on it ever since we can remember. Syria is mostly made, I believe, of sand. Anyhow, that is what it sounds like. And though now this friend of mine, whom I will call Walker, has found a place where he can sail. Up to that time when he last came home, he had not found this place and always looked forward to coming home, chiefly because of being able once more to sail in a small boat. And his children are in this matter just like him. The time they spend without a boat is used up in looking forward to the time when they will have a boat again. They are the sort of children who would put to sea in a brand tub if they had nothing better. Now, about two years ago, when Mr. Walker and his wife and all his children had come home, he rushed off as soon as they had unpacked to a seaport town not far away and there brought two dinghies, one for himself and one for me, on the understanding that it was not to claim my, I was not to claim my one or indeed pay for it until he and his brood had gone back to their desert sands and camels and all the rest of that eastern world. So for a whole summer, my dinghy did not belong to me, but was a regular part, was a part of a regular fleet sailed by the walkers. She proved to be the very best of little ships. And by the time the year was over and boxes were being packed for the East, she was very much beloved by her owners. And I felt what a cruel thing it was that they should have to go off to their mullahs and mosques and leave me sailing in their dinghy on the great lake among the hills. It seemed most unfair. It was just then that I thought it would be what, <laughs> it was just then that I thought what fun it would be if I could write them a book about the swallow and the lake and the island that was their playground as it had been ours and that of our parents before us. And that, I suppose, was really the beginning of the book. So the article continues in this vein, using the Walker name to describe the Altunian family living as they did in Syria, 
And it really is irrefutable evidence that Arthur connected the Artunian family with the Walkers. In his mind, at that time, they are one and the same. Ernest, in brackets, Colonel Walker, served in the Royal Army Medical Corps during World War I and was awarded the Military Cross in France for gallantry in action, by the way. <laughs> The family also say that Arthur and Evgenia wished to take Titty with them back to England. Barbara, Altunyan, Roger's daughter, said, um, Uncle Arthur always liked Titty. She was very artistic and imaginative. So they had a lot in common in that respect. He used to send her snippets of his new book and pictures that he, he had started to draw, which she could finish. These pictures ended up in some of the books. She says that Ransom had basically insinuated that Aleppo was not a good place to bring up Titty and they could give her a better life and education in England. Says Barbara, her parents took great offence and Arthur and Evgenia left very abruptly. Dora gave them her portrait of Titty instead. So this is a portrait of Titty that uh, Dora Altunyan painted and gave to the Ransoms. And um, there is a lot of... Um, uh, correspondence between uh, from from Ernest to Arthur in the Ransom Archive at University of Leeds that evidences this um, disagreement about not only Titty's further education but the rest of the children's education not being given the children not being a given a chance and also um, a, uh, an assumption that Dora was also under Ernest's thumb and not being in, given a chance also. Um, so this portrait is of the Ransoms in the Heald, uh, the house uh, partway up Coniston Water. And uh, according to Roger Wardale, which was a, who was a friend of both of the families, uh, the Ransoms took it with them everywhere which surely indicates the portrait and the child meant a great deal to them. Swallows and Armenians um, celebrates the lives of the Altunyan children, their achievements and those of their parents and grandparents. Here is an excerpt of the audio book narrated by my daughter, Persia Babayan Taylor, and it's a snapshot of the lives of the children in Aleppo. Eventually, thinking their father might soon be called, the children quietened down and settled into a more studious frame of mind, broken by intermittent yawns and stretches. Their teacher, herself now desperate for a refreshing cup of tea, gave them the longed-for moment and rang a little bell which she took out of her pocket. We shall have a twenty-minute break, and I want you to stay in the vicinity of the drawing room notwithstanding the need to use the labs, and I will see you back here on the strike of half past the hour. Makrui, their nanny, had been waiting for the signal and came in as Miss S went out, with four large oranges and a bowl of sugar lumps. The children took an orange each. Merci, digin Makrui! Squeezing and squashing them between their palms, they worked the fruits until they were softened without splitting. Then with one bite and a sugar lump clamped firmly between their teeth. They noisily sucked out the sour juice. As each sugar lump disintegrated, so it was quickly replaced. Rivlets of orange ran down their chins and were hastily wiped away on their sleeves. The skins were soon sucked dry and the children ran off. Roger grabbed a handful of sugar lumps, crunching on them as they all clattered down the steps, bolted out through the heavy front door, climbed the perimeter wall and was soon on the far side of the Muslim graveyard across the road from the house. Far enough away that when Miss returned 20 minutes later, no amount of shouting and gesticulating could get the children back. As she waved frantically at them, so they waved in return and smiled broadly, sending her into paroxysms of shrieking, until at last she turned and went inside, just as the startled figure of Jenia appeared on the balcony. The children quickly ducked behind the wall and hid. When it seemed safe to peep, she had gone and the children carried on with their games. They returned an hour later. They were starting to feel thirsty again and hungry and were told Miss S was ill in bed and there would be no more lessons that day. Roger jigged about with delight to shouts of Hooray! from the girls. 
Let's go to the hospital kitchen, everyone, said Susie. And they all agreed as their rumbling tummies responded to the likeliest place to grab a pre-lunch snack. The children ran out of the house and across Sharia Altunyan to the back of the hospital. Dodging Fat Andronik at the plant room, down the dark corridor they scampered, past the washrooms where all the hospital linen was laundered, and into the airy kitchen, where a big pot of simmering bone stock, the grey foam scum neatly collected from the top, sent plumes of fragrant steam into the air. They were surrounded by frenetic activity and mountains of food. Onions peeled, chopped and grated, piles of fresh herbs, coriander, mint, tarragon, fenugreek and spring onions. A mound of mince goat meat was set on a platter on the massive table in the middle of the room. Next to it was a huge bowl of sulking bulgur, and next to that a wide and shallow pan of fragrant fried goat's mince, sliced almonds, onions and spices. They're making kibbe, said Roger. It's my favourite! Everything's your favourite, Roger, said Susie. But this is my best favourite in the whole wide world! In this really joyous photograph, we've got all our partners really in this project that have joined me on this journey, amazing journey. Shake, Major Chilingirian, Zina Ashbury, Rahel Gazelian, who is Titi's daughter, of course, and my own daughter, Persia, in March last year. Um, this was just before the first COVID lockdown at the old fire station in Carlisle. Um, we, we had that exhibition and all the associated outreach events and we finished them just by the skin of our teeth. So Arthur Ransom's reasons for sidelining the family and their influence on him were many and various, but this project, Swallows and Armenians, brings the Altunyan family back to the centre of the story and through them, the story of the Armenian genocide as part of the literary legacy of the Lake District so that we can properly appreciate the ethnic richness of Britain, British culture, and be connected to the wider world. The, the stories I created for Swallows and Armenians are resonant in our own times of conflict, displacement, and dangerous nationalisms. Ransom's family, the Walkers, by which I mean the Altunyans, are internationally connected and relevant to our times. Um, the touring exhibition continues 18th of September to the 30th of October at the Queen's Hall Art Centre, Hexham, and you can see the Gazellian collection and also the beautiful painting on loan from Teresa Smith of W.G. Collingwood's beautiful swallow painting. Um, and very exciting, Stop Press News, the Cumbria Opera Group will present Swallows and Armenians, the opera, on Sunday the 10th of July 2022. Next, the world. <laughs> and this will happen at Lowther Castle Gardens in Cumbria. Beautiful setting. Swallows and Armenians is published by the Wild Pansy Press, University of Leeds, and you can buy it through my website, easykarenbabian.com and the book through audible.com and uh, at £10 it's a snip and the reviews have been great thank you very much and um, that is the end of my talk and I think we